All right, students of the Rivers of Life International School of Ministry, we are now proceeding. We are now going to lesson six as we continue our lesson in the series, Pointing Men Toward the Cross. Of course, the purpose of what we're doing, the purpose of our school of ministry, is to instruct us and make us prepared and know the story, the gospel story, why the Lord had the proceeding that he did to bring us to the time of Christ. Uh, we're now dealing on the subject of the prophets. Uh, again, progressing. Now, last lesson we talked about the law. Now we're dealing with the prophets. Who were the prophets? What are prophets? And what is the purpose of prophecy? In many cases, in this day and time particularly, we're living with those that carry the title but don't know what it's really all about. So we hope that in this time, we will be able to give you a little, uh, a little bit of insight and instruction and how God used the prophets to fulfill his purpose and to be the mouthpiece to the people. Uh, one thing we have to understand and I'll share this before we go into the heart of the lesson, is that the Lord always had representation, as we'll talk about. Uh, and it is the prophets that come to the people on behalf of the Lord. They come with a word from the Lord. It is the priest that went to God on behalf of the people. So we are talking about the prophets. We're talking about those that will come to give future insight and let the people know the direction that they're going and what the Lord is going to do. In many cases, what's interesting about prophecy is that just because one prophesies or speaks a prophetic word does not always mean in the immediate time. It, it speaks often into the future. That's the difference between prophecy, word of wisdom, and word of knowledge. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge generally deal with the present situation, uh, where we are now, what you're dealing with now. A prophetic word that comes to deal with your situation now, what you're dealing with, what you're going through with, what the Lord is doing even now. Insight to certain things, sometimes even insight to the mindset of people and those in leadership, whether their leadership is good or bad, uh, world events, things that are happening around us. This generally is a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. Prophecy speaks into the future. I oftentimes share this testimony when even comes to my own self. And of course, at this stage of this taping here, I've been in ministry going on 47 years. Uh, many of the things that I've come to in my ministry during that time were prophesied to me as a youth when I first started ministering at the age of 16. Some of those prophecies did not come to pass until 20 and 25 years later because it was speaking into my life. It was speaking into the future. So when we're talking about prophecy. We're talking about future events. Now, that's not really what we're going to dwell with, but I thought I would put that in there because we're starting to deal with the prophets who are declaring the voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord concerning the direction of Israel and even in many cases, the directions to where we are today. Uh, our lesson text is found in, uh, that's the little part, fix that there. Apologize for that. Uh, okay, hopefully that'll last. Uh, our lesson text is taken from, Levit uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah, the ninth chapter. I'm going to get it back here. Isaiah the ninth chapter and verses two through six. Isaiah the ninth chapter and verses uh, Isaiah nine verses two through six. I'm going to read that now. Uh, and the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. And this is what prophecy does. It gives light. It, it shows direction. It shines. It, it enlightens. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast manipulated the nations and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with them and with, with, burning, be with, with burning and fuel of fire. Now this is a prophecy here that Isaiah is now about to give to the people and to the nation. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of 
peace. Again, this is part of the prophecy of pointing men toward the cross. Now, again, when Isaiah is speaking this, he's speaking it before the time of Christ, but he's speaking it into the future as the nation of Israel awaits their salvation, their Messiah and redemption as the entire world, in fact, waits. Our, our memory verse is taken from 1 Peter 2, 20 through 21, saying, knowing this, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecies came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So again, prophecy is spoken. The spirit of the Lord moved upon holy men and they spoke what thus saith the Lord. And then of course our lesson aim, God always has a mouthpiece to speak to his people, whether a teacher, preacher or prophet, the lesson also compares the true, pro uh, true prophets of God to the false prophets and psychics of Satan. Uh, let me say this, that for everything that God has, Satan has a mock. Uh, Satan has a mimic uh, for the purpose of deceiving the people, to give them a false word, to give them a false hope, to give them a false direction, to give them a false religion. Uh, and what we see throughout the scripture, as well as uh, in this day and time, is that there are always people that are declaring themselves wonders. Prophets, psychics, can see into the future, can see into your future. And unfortunately, it's a deception. And because many people are not aware spiritually, and even uh, in the Bible, God forbade them to uh, seek the advice of those that had familiar spirits or psychics. You know, when we are calling on psychics and calling the 900 psychic line and visiting psychic friends and palm readers and tea leaf readers and, 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 and all of that type of thing, we are indulging in those that have familiar spirits, which is inspired by demonic forces, which God has forbidden us to do. So you have to understand that for everything God has is always a mimic. For the prophets, those that speak, and notice what our memory verse says, no prophecy came forth by personal interpretation, but holy men were moved of God to speak. And when they spoke these things, the Bible even further says that you shall know the word of the prophet when the word of the prophet comes to pass. So again, God does never uh, speak lies. And I'm going to tell you something else too, and I say this in reference to many things that I've heard today in this day and time, uh, that the Lord uh, does not have to change his mind. Uh, this is something that we find in the cults, and we were talking, we'll be talking about the cults in some of our future lessons. Uh, one of the things about the cults, uh, and you can tell it's a cult is because they have what's called a continuing revelation, meaning this, that they, their leader may prophesy something that's going to happen. But as time progresses and it looks like it's not going to come to pass, they can very easily change the prophecy and say, well, uh, we've got a new revelation. Well, see, that's not what the Lord does. The Lord is never caught off God, guard. When the Lord sends a word, he knows what's going to happen in the future. That's why he's God. Uh, people that, that come up and say the Lord said this and then turn around and say that the Lord said something else, it means that they are being controlled by a demonic spirit because God never changes his mind. The Lord does not have to change his prophecy. The Lord does not have to change his word. And, and I'll share something with you. Uh, the scripture says uh, that it's impossible for God to lie. You can't think whether it is offhand, but you can look it up. And one day I asked the Lord, Lord, why is it impossible for you to lie? Not that I don't believe it. I do believe it, but I just simply had the question. And the Lord ministered to me and said, the reason why it's impossible for me to lie, one of the reasons is because I never send my word out to see if it will happen. But as a result of my word, things will happen. And the Lord took me to the creation and said, when I spoke, there was nothing to challenge or contradict what I said. When I said, let there be light, there were no two ways about it. Light had to come on the scene because I sent my word out. When I said, let the waters divide, there was nothing big enough in this heavens or in the creation to challenge or contradict me. When I sent my words out, it may, it came to pass. And the Lord is even saying that even in his prophet, prophets today, true prophets of God, when there's a word sent out, if it's not a warning, in some cases, warnings. Or if we take heed, because notice that many of the prophetic warnings that came to the people was, if thou take heed. See, there were conditions to some. But there are some things that God has spoken that there's nothing you can do to change it because it is the irreversible prophetic word of God. Praise the Lord. So now that being said, let's go to our introduction. Uh, prophets are the mouthpiece of God. They are chosen and used by him for the purpose of speaking the mind of God to the people or foretelling future events. Now understand 
to reiterate what I'm saying, and I'm making another point here. There's a difference between predictions and prophecies. Uh, there's a difference between psychic predictions. You know, and I find it interesting why people even listen to psychics in the first place. Every year, these psychics come on and start predicting what's going to happen this year. Usually at the beginning of the new year, uh, the psychics will say, this year I see this happening, this year I see that happening, this is going to happen. And none of them come to pass. None of them. You know, every now and then somebody may, may hit one. You know, and it's almost the hit and miss principle. The reason why sometimes they may hit it because there's a hit and miss principle. You know, you I can say a, a, give you a thousand prophecies. I'm sure to hit a couple of them. You know, just out of the odds. But when God is sending His word, His word will come to pass if, and in fact, it is the word of the Lord. Um, again, it's not a prediction. Prophecy is not a prediction. Prophecy is a sure word from the Lord. For every truth of God, Satan has a counterfeit, and evil spirits control those possessing the ability to divine. Uh, the word divine means uh, spiritual, you know, uh, insight. Uh, and, 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 you know, you look at this situation. Well, here, let me read it. I got it right here. Apostle Paul accounted this when he was preaching in Philippi, when a woman with psychic abilities followed them and prophesied. And this is Acts, the 16th chapter, verse 16 to 18. Paul cast the devil out of her. And she could no longer tell fortunes and give psychic predictions. Christians should never consult psychics. Uh, and this is the thing that I think that we should be clear on and understand. The Lord does not need assistance of psychic spirits. Prophecy does not need the assistance or the confirmation of psychic predictions. And at the same time, and vice versa, you know, we are not able to consult the psychics uh, a situation that happened here recently at the time of this taping where one particular fellow called himself a prophet evidently was listening to this psychic and got up in the church and practically said word for word what the psychic said. Psychic or God's word, the prophets of God never need the assistance of psychic predictions. And let me be clear on that. Let the lesson be clear. Prophets of God, true prophets of God do not need the assistance of psychic predictions. Because God's word is true. Now, again, if you notice what we talked about here in, in the Acts, the, the 16th chapter, uh, a lot of time psychic predictions can have a deal of truth to them. And the reason why I say this is because that many times what the devil does is try to ally himself with the true spirit of God for the purpose of deception, not in agreement, but for the purpose of deception. Now, this young girl, this young slave girl who had the ability to divine, which is what psychics was, had the ability to divine, follow Paul and Silas and prophesied, these be men of God which show us the way of salvation. Now, of course, what she was saying was very true, and it was an attempt by the psychic or the demonic spirit in her to ally himself with true men of God. The reason why that is, is because people start to take uh, confidence in a person if they've allied themselves with people that they know to be men and women of God. So by her allying herself and that spirit allying uh, uh, that themselves to the true men of God, then people would take confidence in her and her psychic predictions, which is what I see a lot of today. I see a lot of people that, that uh, claim to get their revelation from Jesus Christ and, and uh, they're praying to Mary and they're praying to, to other uh, entities that have died, but yet they say that they believe in the power of God. It is a deception from Satan. This young girl followed Paul and Silas and declared, these be men of God, which shows the way of salvation. Paul, being full of the Holy Ghost, knew that it was the wrong spirit. And this is why I say to you students that when we are filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, we can begin to discern. And sometimes you get an uncomfortable feeling about something that you know that's not right. Now I will tell you as a, as a teacher, as a minister, uh, I've had this feeling. And sometimes I don't like the feeling. You know, I've been in places where everybody's getting with it but me. And I start to wonder, what's wrong with me? Why can't I get with it? Well, as time progresses, I begin to see that it's not the spirit of the Lord. It is a spirit that may be similar in the, in the worship. I've been in a place where the people worship, and it's not the, the true spirit of worship. Uh, where, where there's praise, and it's not the true spirit of praise. It's a mimicking demonic force, prophecy, but it's not really the spirit of the Lord. And I feel uncomfortable because of the spirit of the Lord that's inside, inside of me and inside of you that are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, but filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Paul was grieved. And the Bible said he turned to her and called that spirit by name and said, you spirit of divination, I command you to come out of her. And when he did so, her ability to do psychic readings and predictions 
and fortune telling was no longer there. Well, what does that say? That gives us to know that is a demonic spirit that inspires these things in the first place, and we should be aware. All right, let me move on a little further. Uh, Paul cast the devil out of her, and she could no longer tell fortunes and give psychic predictions. Christians should never consult psychics. Let me be clear on that. Christians should never consult psychics. You should not have psychics operating in your church. Again, I've, I've heard stories of even some churches, and again, these people that don't know the Lord, obviously, have psychics on their board. That's demonic. You don't want to ally yourself with demonic spirits. All right, let's go to the discussion of the lesson. The prophets of the Bible, uh, oh, let me, let me, I, I skipped the paragraph. No, let me skip that there. True prophets of God do not have to ask things. They already know them. Often people wear a title of prophet, but most are merely analysts. And after asking a person so many questions, can summarize a situation and then give them a word. But a true prophet of God knows because uh, a true prophet knows because he has revealed to him conditions and states of people already. Questioning or intervening, interviewing them, uh, summarizing is not necessary. Now, what I mean by that is this, that I've, I've been in service where a fellow will practically give an interview. Uh, what is your name? Okay. Uh, how old are you? Uh, are you working? Are you married? Uh, you know, you start asking a bunch of questions. Then after that, give you a word. Well, now, wait a minute. That's not the spirit of the Lord. A true prophet of God, and listen to me when I tell you, even you that are carrying the title of prophets and prophetesses, understand a true prophet of God does not have to ask a person anything. They will tell you what thus said the Lord because the spirit has already revealed that to a prophet. They already revealed that to a prophet. And a prophet will say to you, thus said the Lord. He does not have to ask you anything. He will tell you, thus said the Lord. I'm talking about a true prophet of God. And so this is something that we have to understand. Now I'm saying all this, bring all this out so that when we come to the prophets that begin to prophesy in biblical days in the Old Testament, they were hearing from God. And a point I stated earlier was this, that, uh, you know, the Lord always had a mouthpiece, even in this day and time. The preacher is the mouthpiece of God. When he preaches the gospel, when he preaches the Bible, when he preaches the word, that's the word of the Lord. And in essence, it can be considered prophetic. Now, that is not to say that the pastor is a prophet. That does not to say that the preacher is a prophet. But I will say this, uh, as preachers of the gospel, we do stand in the office of prophet when we are declaring what thus saith the Lord. Now, just because one stands in that office does not necessarily make one the prophet or a prophet. But in that case, he is the prophet that is speaking the word to the people, whether it be the congregation, whether it be uh, in the Bible study, whether it be even on this teaching. Uh, at this moment, I'm teaching the word of the Lord. And therefore, I stand in the office of prophet. Now, again, I don't wear that title. I don't call myself that. It's not necessarily for anybody to call me that or you that would be teaching because just because one prophesies does not make one a prophet. There's more to it than that. And we'll get into that as time progresses. Let me read a little further here. Discussion now. That's where we want to go. The prophets of the Bible were sometimes consultants to kings and were not always popular because they sometimes foretold destruction. Now, here's a telltale uh, of this 21st century, and the argument can be made out of the real prophets. Well, I believe there are prophets in this day and time. I really do. Uh, the problem that I have with many of them is they're not prophets on Bible order. Uh, again, sometimes the prophet has to foretell destruction. The prophets were not always popular in biblical days. Sometimes the people were offended by them. Sometimes the people feared them because, again, when they came with the word, the word was not always good. Now, one of the things that we see in this, this day and time that we're living in now, students, is that... Uh, you know, people have a, even, even I've seen advertisement, come and meet me Wednesday night. I've got a word for everybody that comes. Well, if the Lord was really doing all this speaking, every word wouldn't be good word. And this type of ministry will pack a church out with people waiting to hear a word from the Lord. And everybody that comes to gets a good word. And all it is generally is material uh, stuff. I see new cars. I see money. I see this. I see that. And all they see are substances. When the Lord is really speaking. Everything is not going to be good news, and everything is not going to be material blessings. See, when you have someone that all they prophesize, new cars, new houses, money, this, that, and the other, that's not a prophet. That's a charlatan. That's a con man. 
Not someone diverting your attention away from the real purpose of serving the Lord. I'm not serving the Lord for substance and stuff. I'm serving the Lord because he's God and I'm the servant. And when we miss that message, we are missing our purpose in walking with God. God is not Santa Claus. He's not pouring out stuff because you're a good boy or a good girl. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. Uh, again, going back to the point. Prophets sometimes had to prophesy destruction. Uh, and as we're going to read a little further here about, uh, uh, I think Micaiah is in this lesson here. If not, he's in the next one. Uh, the, the king hated him, had him put in prison because he never prophesied good. Was his, his purpose for that? Now let's read on. I think we're going to run into that. But again, don't be deceived by these prophets that are always prophesying good. Sometime a true man of God has to speak destruction that's coming your way. And in many cases, as I said before, it's a warning. All right. Let's see. Uh, in biblical days, prophets often lived like hermits, secluded from the general population. When they came among the people, they were often feared and revered. They did not always bring good news, but sometimes bad. When the prophet Samuel came among the elders of Bethlehem, they trembled, not knowing if the words of Samuel were peaceable or were of coming judgment. Again, that's 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter. And uh, verse 4 and 5, comest thou peaceably was what the people asked him. And he said peaceably, and they uh, almost breathed a, breathed a sigh of relief because anytime the prophet showed up, because understand, in biblical days, oftentimes the prophets lived like hermits. They lived outside of the village. They were not common among the people, which again is a telltale sign of a true prophet of God. Because uh, prophets that are common among the people and, and laughing and talking among the people and always in the company of people, you, you're not really in a position for God to speak to you because you begin to learn too much about people. You know, a, a true prophet of God doesn't want to know a lot about people. And listen to what I'm telling you. A true prophet of God does not want to know a lot about people because he cannot effectively prophesy to them in a pure word from the Lord because he knows too much. If I know you quite well, and I've sat at your house and had dinner, and we laughed and talked, and, and we did things together, and I get a word from the Lord, how am I sure it's a word as opposed to my personal feelings? Or even if I get a word of destruction, the Lord has given me a word to warn you. How can I effectively warn you if I have a relationship with you, a friendly relationship with you? It's not always possible. It's not always possible. So word to the wise. If you're really walking in the office of prophecy, don't be too common among the people. Okay, let me read a little further here. Prophecies were often parallel in that day, not only dealt with natural events, but spiritual at the same time. The Lord even told prophet Hosea to marry a harlot and continue to rescue her whenever she would return to Horeb to illustrate how he loved Israel and would continue to reach out to her even when she backslid into idolatry. In other words, what the Lord did was by uh, using Hosea to go through this process of rescuing a whore, marry her and rescue her even though she would go back into whoredom. He used his life or this episode in life as a prophecy to the people of God. Because Israel kept backsliding. Israel kept going into whoredom. Israel kept going back and doing things. And as we talked in times past, abomination, abomination, uh, uh, idolatry was an abomination in the eyes of the Lord. An abomination is a direct sin against God. But to show his love toward the people, he had Hosea demonstrate this by his life. So he told him, go and marry a whore, Gomer, marry her, you know. And uh, he'd marry her, bring her in, set her up, treat her right. She'd backslide on him and go right back into whoredom. And the Lord said, this is what Israel's doing to me. But he told her, Hosea, go get her. And he did this several times until finally he began to have a love for Gomer. He began to genuinely go after her because he loved her. And the Lord was showing Israel, this is how I am toward you. You keep going into whoredom, but I keep going after you because of my love for you. So in this case, the prophecy by the prophet, the man of God, was demonstrative of the way God feels toward his people. Prophet, not speaking a word, but living that word, accomplishing that word, paralleling, paralleling that word to the people. Uh, Isaiah was known as the eagle eye prophet because he saw far into the future. 
He prophesied the coming of the Messiah, giving the nation of Israel a hope for restoration and mankind a hope for redemption. This was part of our uh, lesson text. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Uh, and, and again, in Isaiah 9 and 6, uh, the Lord was uh, showing, giving Isaiah a word in the future. What was going to take place? Again, a part of the prophet seeing into the future. And uh, Isaiah, again, was referred to as the eagle eye prophet because he saw hundreds of years into the future. What the Lord was going to do. Now, remember what I said from the onset. Prophecy does not always mean at the present time. Prophecy is the foretelling of the future. Again, not a prediction, but a direct word that will come to pass according to the word of the Lord. Uh, let's continue to read here. Since Israel was the nation that God dealt with in the Old Testament, the prophets often told of the destiny of the nation, always giving hope of redemption. Yet Israel did not always understand that redemption was for all of mankind and not just the nation. This part was part of the parallel prophecy. Isaiah's redemption meant mankind's redemption, or Israel's redemption meant mankind's redemption. They looked at the prophecies of the Messiah to restore the nation and destroy their enemies, but the prophecies most importantly pointed to a Messiah that would restore mankind back to God. The prophecies pointed to the cross. So again, once again, we're talking about parallel prophecies. Now, what do we mean by parallel prophecies? Sometimes prophecies of the Bible can be parallel to things in our lives or parallel even in nations. Some of the prophecies that the Lord sent to Israel can be compared to nations today because in some cases there's a similarity or a parallel in the nations today. The route that we take, the backsliding that we do, the going into idolatry, even though we may not worship idols, people now worship their cars, they worship their jobs, they worship uh, politicians, they worship athletes, they worship celebrities. So it's still the same principle of going into idolatry, even though it might not be exactly the same thing. It is a parallel. And the prophecies that apply to Israel in the Old Testament also apply to us in this day. So we should never discard, which is why sometimes people say, students, that uh, we should disregard the Old Testament because all it dealt with was Israel. Well, in a sense, it dealt with Israel, but that's not all it dealt with. It dealt with even the nations and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we're pointing man to the cross, Jesus redeeming mankind to himself. The scripture says this in the book of uh, St. John, the first chapter, he came to his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So even though Israel rejected the Messiah, after all of these prophecies pointed to Jesus as Messiah, even though they rejected him. And why did they reject him? Because they thought the Messiah was going to come and restore Israel on this earth. Jesus preached a heavenly kingdom and started the church. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Now gates of hell will prevail against a lot of things, governments, Man, mankind, uh, all kind of stuff. That, you know, in this day and time, the, the gates of hell have prevailed against a lot of stuff. But the church is still standing because of the prophecy. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That's the word of the Lord. And no matter what has happened down through the uh, millenniums and even to this day, all the things uh, men have fallen, uh, uh, leaders have fallen, uh, various things that have happened, the church is still standing because the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's prophetic. All right, let's go a little bit further. Uh, let's see, let's go to the application. I think I'm finished here. Uh, many of the television personalities carry the title of prophet or prophetess, comparing the prophets of the Bible with those titles as such today in many cases shows a great contrast. Whereas those titles prophets today appear to be popular among the people and always prophesying blessings and prosperity, biblical prophets were often despised and treated harshly. Uh, King Ahab despised the prophecies of Micaiah and even had him imprisoned because he never prophesied good things but evil things to him. That's 1 Kings 22 and 8. Uh, now, it's interesting about this. Uh, you know, again, compared to today's prophets, well, or, or those that are called prophets, it's almost like you're looking at a fashion show. You know, they're glamorous, they're dressed to the nines, terminology we use here in the United States. Uh, they're, they're, their nails are manicured, their hair is fine, and they just look like, you know, 
is something out of fashion magazine. And they're popular. They're charismatic. They're, they're, they're great orators. But this is a contrast to the prophets of the Bible. As I said before, the prophets of the Bible oftentimes lived like hermits. They lived in remote places. They didn't live among the people. And when they showed up, the people shuddered. The people didn't always like them. Uh, I think of Isaiah who was despised because he never prophesied. He always prophesied to the king and the people to the point where they threw him in a pit. They didn't want to hear anymore. They only wanted to hear good things like people today. People disregard a true man, a true woman of God when they're preaching the truth. The truth is offensive. The role of that uh, lifestyle and that attitude and that is destructive. And so a man or woman of God will tell them, this is not the right path. This is not the path of God. Well, so-and-so said that uh, I'm going to prosper. And we only think of prophecy as, as financial prophecy, prophecies of substance, prophecies of things. You know, that's the only type of prophecy that we want to hear. We don't want to hear that the ways of sin is death, that the life you're living is wrong. That what you're doing is heading for destruction. It may look fine now, but if you don't know God in the midst of your trouble, you're going to fall under the pressure. We don't want to hear that. Now here, interesting thing about Micaiah. Micaiah was not liked by King Ahab. And his reason was he never prophesied good. He always prophesied evil. Uh, Ahab took it personal against Micaiah. Even though he was not living right, even though he was not doing right, even though he was outside of the will of the Lord, and there are consequences of being outside of the will of the Lord, even though he was uh, 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 fellowshipping and, and, and uh, indulging in idolatrous things, doing other things that he had no business doing, uh, again, prophecy was against him. And so the man of God would prophesy his destruction, his trouble. He was wrong. Well, of course, Micaiah took it, or rather, Ahab took it personally. And had the man put in jail. And when Jehoshaphat came and said, Are there prophets of the Lord that we might inquire? Here's an interesting thing. Ahab had 450 prophets, I believe it was. Or 350, I think it was. Somewhere thereabouts. And all of them prophesied, Go up to Rome of Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall prosper in your way. All of them said this. And then one one, Zedekiel, built horns of iron and gave it to King Ahab and said, thus saith the Lord, with this thou shalt destroy them and push them back. All of that glamour, all of that sensationalism, all of that, and yet all of those prophets were lying. Because the Bible said that God had put a lying spirit in the mouths of all of those prophets. And may I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, students of this, this school, that there are many out there carrying the title of prophet that are lying prophets, that are not prophesying what thus saith the Lord. They're prophesying lies. They're prophesying what the people want to hear. And as a result, people are headed for destruction. He didn't like Micaiah. All right. Now let's read a little bit further. King Ahab was persuaded by his prophets controlled by lying spirits. First Kings 22 and 22. And eventually went to his death. Eventually went to his death. The pattern is often repeated today by those only seeking to harden to good prophecies, but never giving heed to warnings by true men and women of God. And again, this starts to minimize the true men and women of God, the true prophets and prophetesses of God. Because as I stated before, if God was really doing all this speaking that they say he was, everything would not be good news. There would be warnings. First thing that I believe the Lord will say to many of you is that you that are shacking up and you're not married, you need to get married. You're not going to get no good prophecy until you do the right thing. All right, I'm supposed to be teaching a lesson. <laughs> I kind of got out there. But again, these are the challenges of students that we will face as men and women of God, regardless of what part of ministry we're going to. These will be the challenges that you will chase, that face. Some of these very types of challenges that people that are not going to do right, and yet they want you to prophesy good. People that not live according to the word of God, and yet they want a good word from you. People that will not heed to the scripture, and yet they want you to tell them good things. And if you're going to stand on the truth of God's word, sometimes you will have to tell them that they're wrong. And they don't want to hear that. And they may lose, uh, no longer befriend you. Well, again, if you're living like biblical prophets, it wouldn't make that much of a difference to you anyway, because you just really wouldn't have a lot of friends. You know, you would put yourself in position. To be used by God. 
Let me read a little bit further. The pattern is often repeated. I've said that before. I read it again. The pattern is often repeated today by those seeking, by only by those only seeking to hearken to good prophecies, but never giving heed to warnings by true men and women of God. The spirit of the present age also despises warnings, and would rather be left alone. True prophets and true men and women of God see the destruction and judgment coming upon the land. Now, this is something that I think is important. If you're really going to walk in the ministry of the prophetic, and that is, you must continue to keep yourself in position to hear a word from the Lord. Oftentimes, destruction will come, and there's nobody that will see it coming, because again, people have sold out that will call themselves prophets, but will take on the standard of the world to be prop, to be popular. You know, I mean, if I'm on... Uh, and, and you need to watch this. Again, I'm saying this to many of our students. You need to watch these quote-unquote prophets that spend more time raising money, and in many cases raising money for themselves, uh, and, and, and they're not going to give you a word unless you give them money. I was in a service once, and again, I'm, I'm sharing this as a teacher to students. I was in a service once where uh, the man of God declared himself a prophet and told everybody, and there's a longer story to it, but I'm making it short, told everybody, get in the line with $100. Uh, and as they came through the line, he laid hands on them, took the money, and then gave them a prophecy. And again, all the prophecies were good. All of them. That must have been about almost 100 people that came through that line. <laughs> I have to admire his courage for being original with all those prophecies. I, I really have to admire that much in him, even though he was a false charlatan. But I have to admire the fact that he was able to prophesy to, to oh my goodness, it looked like 100 people. And as soon as they gave him the money, and he put it in the basket, his basket. Then he began to say to them, uh, the Lord said, I see new furs, and I see a new wardrobe for you. The Lord is going to give a new wardrobe. Next, next person come up, same thing. Take the money, put it back. You know, uh, you've been praying for a vacation. I see the Lord opening the door for the vacation. And I'm sitting there watching this. And uh, those that didn't have the money, I guess they weren't going to get a prophecy. You know, well, there was already enough people in the line to fulfill his financial desire, but again, just a charlatan, using a gift. If in fact he was gifted, and understand the Bible says that gifts and calls come without repentance. A person can be gifted and yet not be anointed. A person can be gifted with the gift of prophecy, and understand there's a difference between having a gift and being a true prophet of God. But a person can be gifted with prophecy and do that and pull it off, but he's done it for his personal gain. If you're doing that for personal gain, Beware, because God will get you for that. All right, I'm still teaching here. I'm trying to teach. I don't want to get in preach mode. I'm trying to teach. Students, I hope you're learning from this. We're almost done here. Uh, let's see. Where were we? In many cases, judgment has started, but the warnings are suppressed or explained away, sometimes by others uh, claiming to be prophets. Because of the lack of popularity, the wealth goes with it. Many have taken gifts and used them to their own profit. God will judge them. As I said, they've taken the gift and used it to their own purpose, their own profit. They neglected the word of the Lord. And in some cases, they will suppress or try to explain away when the Lord speaks. When the Lord speaks judgment to a nation. When the Lord speaks judgment to a people, when the Lord speaks judgment to a person, someone else will call along, claiming to be a prophet, and will try to explain it away. No, it didn't really mean that. No, you can't pay attention to that fellow that told you that. No, just explain it away. God's going to hold them to judgment. Uh, we should remember that the ultimate purpose of every gift is to deify the church and point men to the cross. It is only the cross that provides men's redemption from sin. To have wealth and popularity and still be eternally lost makes it all in vain. Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange in his, for his soul? St. Matthew 16, 26. Again, we oftentimes quote that because this is what is happening to people uh, that are not pointing you to the cross. The purpose of prophecy is to give a word from the Lord to point men in the right direction, to encourage men in what they're doing, to know that they're on the right paths. As I said before, there were prophecies I received as a youngster. And you know, 
I oftentimes say that there was a whole lot that happened between the time the prophecy first came and the time it came to pass. There was a whole lot in between that time. Trouble, trial, tribulation, setback, persecution, before I finally came to the fulfilling of the prophecy. But the word from the Lord encouraged me, and sometimes even uh, word of wisdom and knowledge in between that, that encouraged me to continue to follow on the right path because the blessing was into the future. Uh, let's go to our lesson illustration, and we're almost finished with this particular lesson. In recent years, so-called lost books of the Bible and the curiosity of, the, curiosity of them have resurfaced. Author Dan Brown wrote a book called The Da Vinci Code with the false message that the myth of Jesus was created in later years, and there were other suppressed books that never referred to him as Messiah. What many people do not know about Mr. Brown's book is that it was mostly fic uh, fiction, and there were more than 200 factual errors in it. Now, again, some of you remember a few years ago, this Da Vinci Code, they even made a movie out of it, which was myth. People don't understand. It was, it was a myth. It was fiction. Uh, there, were, there were no historic uh, accuracy in it, over 200 historic errors, 200 historic errors. It was not a fact. It was a book of fiction that made Mr. Dan Brown a lot of money, that made the studios, Hollywood Studios, a lot of money. But there was, it, was a, it was a lie. But again, these type of things come forth uh, to discredit the Bible. Many of the books that it refers to in the, in, in, in the book are from what are called the Gnostic Gospels, meaning they were not included in the original canon of books known today as the Bible. What he fails to state is that why these Gnostics were not included. Now, you can actually get a published book of these Gnostics, which again were books uh, that were not included in the Bible, similar to the Apocrypha, the Old Testament, the ancient writings. Now, I wouldn't discard the Apocrypha because many of those ancient writings uh, did have some truth in them, but again, they're not included in the Bible. Uh, but the Gnostics were actually books, and, and, and let me give you information here. Well, I tell you, let me read it because I have it in here. Uh, first of all, the New Testaments were written in the first century by either eyewitnesses or the disciples of Christ. Of the Gnostics, the earliest books were written in the second century. Second, many of the Gnostics were proven forgeries, credit given, given to individuals who had been dead before the books were written. The book, The Da Vinci Code, is an attempt by Satan to turn man from the cross, but mankind's only hope remains at the cross. Again, we're pointing man to the cross, but let me take a few seconds in our closing here to deal with the Gnostics. Uh, again, the Gnostics what were referred to as lost books of the Bible, uh, where many of them were not included in the canonization of the scriptures. Now, again, all of the Bible that we have, including the Pauline epistles, the Peter epistles, uh, the book of Revelation, uh, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the book of Acts, all of these were written in the first century, and there are eyewitness accounts. Uh, in the case of St. Mark, it is actually Peter's account that, that Mark wrote. So, again, it was the, the, the eyewitness, the witness to an eyewitness. Uh, and so when we read these books in the, in, that are included in the New Testament, they were in the first century, written in the first century by eyewitness accounts. The Gnostics, many of them were proven forgeries, uh, giving credit to individuals that had already been dead, and were not written until the second century, many of them. And so as a result, they could not have been uh, eyewitness accounts. Now, the argument that Dan, Dan Brown makes in his book and others that have examined these Gnostics will say, well, many of these books never called Jesus the Messiah. They had other, uh, they, they never said these miracles took place. Well, of course not. The people weren't there. And many of them were an attempt uh, to profit from the Christian accounts. Uh, and so they, they created these uh, writings and, and they got preserved. And somewhere. But again, when they began to examine the canonization of the scripture in the fourth century, because the Bible as we know it, the compiled Bible, was not compiled until the fourth century. Uh, now, all of the books existed back to the first century, but the compilation, the canonization, did not play, take place until the fourth century. So all of these other books existed because they were written in the second century. But when the scholars, uh, 350 of them from all over the then known world, the bishops that come together during the uh, Malin Conference, I believe it was, they began to examine these scriptures and certain ones were left out because of a number of reasons. As I stated before, they were forgeries or they included uh, 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 things in them like sorcery and things that were forbidden 
uh, by the Bible, the Old Testament, forbid for uh, sorcerers and psychics and those with familiar spirits. And some of these were included in these Gnostic writings. Uh, Gnostic writings. So, of course, the scholars, the, father, the fathers, the bishops excluded them for the right purpose. And I will say, and I will go on record as saying that those that are considered lost books of the Bible should stay lost because they're not pointing man toward the cross. And so this is what we have. We're dealing with the quote unquote lost books of the Bible. All right, that concludes lesson six. Uh, we hope that you learned something from that. Again, go on and answer the questions after the lesson here in your textbook. The uh, question, the answers are in the text. Review it, go by. I will also encourage you to look up the scriptures that we quoted. Now, again, I didn't have time to read all of them, uh, but I would encourage you to look them up uh, so that you may know and better understand what we are trying to say. Until our next lesson, lesson seven, the prophecies, which is next, we'll deal with that in time. God bless.